together with um, with Erica's input and now uh, Laurence's message, I think we've got a very good framing from the, the top level of discussions uh, at the COP on implementation of the Paris Agreement, where the call for these uh, strategies uh, emanates from and uh, going down to the bottom up involvement of uh, civil society and citizens in, in national climate policy that provides I think a good framework for us to now indeed go to the presentation uh, on the results of the analysis and uh, there was a whole team involved but here are the, the two people um, who've uh, you know done most of the writing and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from you Eike and Nick take it away. Thank you, Matthias. Um, so let me start screen sharing. <clears throat> I hope you can all see the presentation. Great. So I'm very happy to be here today uh, and to be able to pre present our key findings together with my colleague, Nick. So I have to thank ECF for their encouragement and support, uh, in particular also the team at Ecologic that helped us uh, making this happen and partners from Vice Europa, from the Joseph Stefan Institute and from the Swedish Environment Institute Tallinn, uh, contributing to this assessment. Um, so the scope of our work was to extract, assess and compare the information from the existing long-term strategies. By the time of writing, this was 22. Five were missing, uh, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Ireland, Poland and Romania. In the meantime, we have Cyprus, with a submitted strategy, so that is not included. We aimed at identifying good practice examples in, the, um, in terms of the information provision and in terms of ambition. We used um, different examples to better understand what actually makes a good LTS. And then we derived overarching conclusions and recommendations to make suggestions for improving any upcoming strategies and the related processes. We started our analysis uh, by identifying what a good LTS needs. Uh, this builds on the governance regulation, which has a few mandatory elements and a voluntary annex. We also use past work of us and of others, such as IDRI, Can Europe, or the uh, World Research Institute. Um, we can see here a selection uh, in this visual and includes elements like sectoral information, uh, the technologies, lifestyle change, the value of nature, just transition and finance aspects. We also found that it needs a good basis. So this includes, for example, participation in the developing of an LTS as well as scientific inputs and scenarios. Um, the objective was to look at two different qualities. So we looked at the long-term vision that is outlined in the strategies. So this is about the countries envisaging how they actually envisaging their net zero future and how they want to get there and what are the key enablers to drive the transition. And we also assessed the relevance of the long term strategies in a national context. And here we focused on the preparation process, follow up and integration of the strategies um, to better understand the impact of the documents. Uh, the visuals you can see here actually try to capture what we understand to be relevant. And a big thanks goes to the designer of Novel Studio in this case, because they made it happen to put our thinking into visuals. Our assessment was based almost solely on the long-term strategies. So we considered some external documents, but generally we thought that the long-term strategies should speak for themselves. We assessed the strategies based on an analytical framework. It basically consists of different categories. So here you can see the long-term targets and sectoral elements. Then in these categories, we had different dimensions. So for example, energy demand. And in each dimension, we use criteria to structure the information collection. So for energy demand, we had a look at the primary energy consumption, final energy consumption, as well as emission reduction in each of the energy consuming sectors. The report outlines the findings structured along the categories and dimensions. And for each of the dimensions, we actually followed the same basic structure. So we first uh, have a short introduction about the relevance of the topic. Uh, then we have a section about the information that we found across the long-term strategies, and finally a short summary. And in the information section, we always try to condense the information into tables. In many cases, this is qualitative and quantitative information. 
We complemented our analysts with expert interviews in eight countries. This was particular to better understand the relevance of the documents uh, because it wasn't easy to get that information out of the strategies themselves. So now coming to the results for the two qualities, vision and relevance. Uh, and in fact, we could present each single item for about half an hour or so. So today we give you a short intro or a short overview of some particular elements uh, in more detail. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I start with the long-term vision. And here we think that long-term strategies, uh, strategies should guide countries on their way to climate neutrality. This needs a picture of the net zero future and how actually countries want to get there. There are different solutions to consider to make available in time and to complement on different scales. And this differs from country to country. So the long-term strategies should highlight what a country considers as their way to providing the basis for policy decisions today and in the near term, and also considering thereby specific lead times for implementation and impact. For the assessment, we looked at four elements, which you can see here. Uh, so this is the long-term climate targets, including the net zero year, GHG emission reduction and pathways. Sectoral elements included energy supply, demand, agriculture and GHG removal. Hydrogen biomass and CCUS, so carbon capture, utilization and storage is included in technology. And then we have the horizontal elements, behavior change, finance, just transition and climate adaptation. Looking into one of these in more detail, so here you can see the results for the long-term climate targets. So we found there is an alignment of national targets with the EU objective of reaching climate neutrality by 2050. So with 20 strategies delivering a net zero target year. Many also have this target in a law. However, the picture is less clear when it then comes to the contributions of emission reductions and removals to achieve this respective target and also for the related pathways. So from the 22 long-term strategies, actually only 12 provided an emission reduction estimate for the long-term. Uh, good examples included here, for example, the Netherlands and Hungary, which outlined an emission reduction of 95%. The information on removals that would balance the remaining emissions was actually only available from 10, uh, 10 strategies. Um, below in the table, you can see uh, our examples, so good practice examples. So for example, Finland and Austria provide clear information on GHG emission reduction and removals, and they also want to achieve net zero well before 2050. When we come to specific uh, sectoral elements, so here you can see an overview um, across all countries that provided numbers uh, on the emission reduction in each of the sectors. And the table basically shows that, uh, for example, in power generation, the reductions are going close to zero. There are also high reduction in buildings and transport across countries. And large differences actually can be found in agriculture. So here starts the range at around 20% uh, up to 70%. And we assume this, is, this different mainly comes from different assumptions on compensating emissions through technical and natural sinks. Another example you can see here is the fossil fuel use in 2050. And most countries do not provide a clear number, but rather statement how they see fossil fuel use in 2050. So the table is a, basically a combination of numbers and uh, statements. So Lithuania, for example, wants to phase out fossil fuel and energy generation by 2045 and Luxembourg by 2050. We have statements from Portugal and Finland and France. So they want to phase out coal. Then Portugal, for example, in addition, has a phase out date for natural gas and power generation and France and Austria want to phase out heating oils by 2050. And then we have some other, they have more a general statement uh, that is like uh, energy generation will be climate neutral or carbon neutral. Without specifying that in all detail. In summary, our key findings from checking the vision of the strategies what that there is good practice with every country having its own recipe. <laughs> but overall and across all strategies, there is actually not enough uh, long term vision from our point. This means we found very different strategies in terms of structure and content. And often content was limited, in particular because not all countries included quantified information. 
uh, some delivered numbers, but for scenarios that do not reach the national target. Um, and then LTSs with numbers used actually different units and base year varied significantly. This altogether made it actually quite challenging for us to compare and assess the information. However, however overall, and as explained before, we see that national long-term targets are mostly aligned with the EU objective, but that underlying emission reduction and the GHG removal remain partly unclear. We found that energy consumption generally declines while renewables take over. We also see that there is some flexibility between agricultural emission reduction, use of CCS and GHG removal. So for example, the strategy of Hungary shows an exceptional high emission reduction in agriculture so that the country can achieve its 95 emission reduction goal. And Italy sees a quite significant role of CCS compared, for example, to other countries. All countries uh, assume changes in behavior, although here the information was of mainly qualitative nature. And finally, all governments see that the transition will need additional investment, which is overall beneficial for economic growth and employment. Other benefits include positive health, health impacts, in particular due to better air quality, healthier dietary habits, and more active modes of transport. And now I hand over to Nick to present our findings on the relevance of strategies and conclusions and recommendations. Thank you, Eike. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, so I'll be presenting our findings on the relevance, as mentioned, uh, of LTSs in their respective national contexts. And by relevance, what we really mean here is the use of the strategy as a tool for planning national climate action and in some way how seriously the country actually considered the task and took the task at hand. And so to get at this, we looked at, um, next slide please. We looked at uh, the preparation of the strategy. Um, this include compliance with the governance regulation requirements, um, as well as the scientific basin and participation um, elements. Follow up to the strategy, such as implementation responsibilities, monitoring and revision. And finally, the integration of the strategy uh, its position within other national climate governance uh, structures and reference to and coherence with the medium-term plans. So it's important to note that the scope of the work done specifically on relevance did not allow us to peek under the hood of all national governance systems. Just because an aspect is not mentioned in the LTS does not mean that it does not exist. Um, however, that said, we specifically were investigating governance structures for long-term planning and therefore one would expect this to be found in the LTS where else. So uh, we tried to present the information we found similarly as in the vision section, showing countries side by side. But of course, for this, it was far more highly qual and qualitative information. Uh, and therefore, we also relied on uh, expert interviews to get a sense uh, in, for at least eight countries, um, kind of a behind the scenes look at uh, the LTS in the, in the general governance context specific for climate policymaking. Um, to provide some sense of what we found, um, on the relevance of LTSs, I'd like to zoom in first on follow-up and then on the integration component. So on to follow-up. Um, the first key impression here re regarding information uh, in the LTSs is, is that uh, there's a clear missing, uh, there are clearly missing responsibilities. Only a third of the strategies assign who is accountable for following up on the document itself. This means initial development, coordination with other government bodies, reviewing and revising the LTS, managing the public participation uh, channels, et cetera. Most often this came in the form of a leading or coordinating ministry. Of course, one could argue that this role falls implicitly to the same ministry who developed the strategy in the first place. Nevertheless, some strategies divide up the roles significantly more concretely. The French, Lithuanian and Estonian strategies, for example, in particular describe systems where sectoral duties are assigned to the various respective ministries with respect to the long-term planning. Um, but nevertheless, uh, strategies do not seem to be used by governments to create new institutions or processes or really assign um, clear roles for follow-up. In a few exceptional cases, the strategies themselves describe new monitoring and reporting systems uh, or assign new monitoring tasks to existing institutions. So two examples here include the Hydrometeorological Institute in Czechia and the Interministerial Commission on Air, Climate Change, and Circular Economy in Portugal, which both now have new tasks uh, defined in the, LT the LTS for each respective country. Important to note is that the governance regulation does not require member states to use their LTS to bolster their national climate governance systems. 
Even so, the strategy is a national document and could serve to further operationalize long-term climate planning, especially um, in lieu of a, of a framework climate law. However, from our analysis, it seems that in most member states, the LTS does not appreciably expand climate governance structures. When it comes to monitoring and LTS revision, uh, what we, we term this, we, we, we call this a policy learning cycle uh, in the report, the picture is uh, equally vague. A quick reminder here is that the government's regulation requires 10-year updates, but encourages a review every five years to align more closely with the NECP cycle. Only a third of the assessed countries state concretely in their LTS that they intend to follow the five-year revision cycle. Overall, the documents are vague on the foreseen review in general and provide little to no information on methodologies or timelines. A few countries nevertheless stand out as good practice. Here, France, again, enshrines um, a pretty concrete five-year policy learning cycle in a national law. This is based off the national strategy uh, that pre-existed, uh, pre um, uh, national strategy cycle, long-term strategy cycle that pre-existed the governance regulation. Um, and this is also based on a dynamic evaluation rubric and expert consultation. Both Estonia and Malta have similar review cycles that they describe in the LTS. Um, nevertheless, uh, albeit for Estonia, it's for a shorter term uh, time horizon, only for 2030. Next slide, please. Moving on to um, integration. The, this we, is more or less getting at the weight of the LTS in a national governance context. And it was quite difficult to gauge, of course, from the documents themselves and the interviews provided uh, significantly more insights. Um, first of all, it seems that countries seem, you, they use their LTSs as a mean to compile all current and planned climate actions and more or less scribe this and submit this uh, to the European Union. For instance, Czechia, Hungary, and Latvia all describe in very detail how their respective strategies relate to other sectoral or national planning processes uh, and do this in a bit more detail than, the, than compared to others. Um, good practice, however, can be found in France, Malta, Portugal, and Spain, where the LTS describes how it's featured concretely as the long-term planning tool in a national climate framework law, um, which of course is a, is a separate <clears throat> separate uh, regulation altogether. And it is more or less the, the anchored, therefore, in national governance structures more um, concretely. When it comes to NECP LTS coherence, a full quantitative evaluation of this is absolutely necessary. Um, it was beyond the scope of this report. Again, we did not consult the NECPs in any significant detail. Um, however, for the most part, at least what's described in the LTSs, they, most documents take note of the requirement for coherence between the short and long-term planning horizons and insist that this is the case, uh, that the documents were developed in tandem, that there was coordination. Um, sorry, this, uh, sorry. <laughs> However, as a proxy for a full analysis, we just considered full criteria, the timing of submission, common methodologies between the two documents, referencing between the two, and of course, um, and last but not least, common ministerial oversight. Next slide, please. Just to give a sense um, on the ministerial oversight piece, um, it's particularly interesting because perhaps surprisingly, it, it seems that the two documents were not always prepared by the same ministry. Uh, many countries divided up responsibilities between two or even more, three, four ministries, for instance, oftentimes between the econ economy and uh, in energy, and then the environment ministry doing the long-term perspective. Given the sometimes conflicting priorities um, between these different realms of, uh, in terms of policymakers working in these different realms, it could undermine the cohesiveness of short and long-term planning over, uh, overall, unless there are clear lines of interministerial communication and coordination. Next slide, please. So to sum up uh, key, rel key findings for the, for the relevance portion of the report, good practices exist. Uh, and it is clear that simply the act of developing a strategy can have a positive effect on climate governance, whether this is further mainstreaming of climate action in, by expanding the burden of responsibility, additional stakeholder and public involvement, transparency over long-term processes, or even in a few exceptional cases, the creation of new processes and institutions. However, um, in many cases, it seemed to be um, a box checking exercise and uh, participatory processes were often lacking in depth, or at least the information on these were, was lacking in depth and representation could have been better implemented. LTS updating and progress monitoring does not seem to be a priority. In general, long-term progress monitoring does not seem to be a priority. And there's also a lack of clear follow-up responsibilities on the documents themselves. NECP LTS alignment exists on paper, um, but uh, some things, such as the timing of the development, uh, given also the tardiness of many of these LTS systems in, in general, uh, and the fact that four are still outstanding, and who is responsible, um, suggests there's, there's reason to be dubious about the statements in the documents themselves. 
We use the image of a map throughout the reports. And of course, Erica uh, brought this up again at this top to reiterate the importance of seeing these strategies as governance tools. They should be dynamic blueprints that set a course, um, revised, discussed, updated entirely by design. If you take this as the ideal starting point, um, the overarching message arising from our assessment of relevance is that the LTSs are significantly underutilized in national policymaking in most cases. So next slide, please. To try to round everything out, conclusions for both vision and relevance, it's clear that good practices exist. Um, France, Spain, and Portugal stand out in, in the group. All three of these strategies provide good information on their long-term vision, including details on total and sectoral greenhouse gas emission reductions, and at least to some extent on the use of hydrogen, biomass, CCUS, sinks, um, and therefore give a, give a good sense of where they see the country headed for 2050. These three also embed their LTS as the long-term planning element of a national climate framework law with regular cycles of review and describe more um, robust participatory and stakeholder engagement processes and also plans for future um, stakeholder engagement and participatory processes that go over and above the, the requirements in the governance regulation. However, most others LTSs lack significant detail and seem to be disconnected from national climate policymaking. Um, this could come down to the lack of guidance and emphasis from the EU level and a, maybe a disproportional emphasis on the medium term. In the end, these, of course, are EU obligated planning tools. And therefore, coming to the, our, our recommendations, the first and foremost would be, uh, next slide, please, would be in the, con in the context of the governance regulation. The most critical recommendation is that the governance regulation should be revised to include a mandatory template. Currently, this is a, a uh, in the annex, it's a, it's a suggested template. Um, that is quite um, meager, in, certainly in compared to the NECP um, template. This should ask countries to provide greater detail because we've seen the LTSs are lacking information on their long-term vision. And these are in, also in no way harmonized, making it very difficult as we experience firsthand to assess and compare these, which is something that of course the, commi the commission is going to need to do. The governance regulation should also be revised to require a more frequent update. Um, so as I said, 10 years is the current required update with a five year suggested update. Um, but given the timing of development, it is far from certain that the strategies are actually in line with NECPs. Um, many came after the NECPs, which is not the ideal. You want to of course set your goals in advance and then come up with the uh, intermediate actions to get there. So and not, uh, in addition to that, many are already out of date, making them unusable for current planning needs. The importance of participation was reflected by Dr. Tubiana at the start. Um, it's also, of course, reflected in Article 10 of the governance regulation and in the multi-level dialogues. But from our assessment, it seems that member states did a lackluster job on this, or at least certainly many did. From what we could tell, only four member states described consultations at two stages in LTS development, such as before and after a draft document is available, which we would consider a bare minimum to allow for effective consultation with the public and also, of course, uh, stakeholder groups. The governance regulation should therefore strongly encourage more effective consultations. And it remains to be seen, however, to what extent the multi-level dialogues may be used for this purpose. Um, when it comes to national governance, these also have a role to play, um, not only on participation, but when it comes, the LTSs are highly technical uh, by nature. And thus we recommend that countries should also engage in some form of peer review process or expert opinion. Perhaps surprisingly, um, this did not seem to be the case, or at least this could have happened way more behind the scenes than it was for us able to, to tease out. Um, but this should draw on ex existing expert bodies where possible. Um, ideally, a national climate advisory body, such as the Climate Council, would have a dedicated role in LTS development, even if only to check the assumptions and underlining scenarios um, that uh, put forward by the government. We're aware that many of such councils there are, are coming into existence and came into existence after or in the middle of the LTS development process. So this is something that we would hope to see uh, significantly more um, used in the future. National governments could also anchor and should also anchor long-term planning in governance structures more clearly by mandating the dedicated review cycle at national level for 2050 climate ambition, and also setting a date for net zero. We've seen that even countries with a net zero target do not specific, specify how they will achieve it, often leaving out relevant detail and removals. And climate neutrality targets need to be clearly communicated so that they're taken seriously um, and with concrete figures on what net zero means and when it will be achieved. Finally, on the part of the commission, certainly not least, we see the need for further technical support and experience sharing. Given the range in quality, both on scenario building and presentation in the strategies themselves, and the range in the detail of information, it is clear that many countries would benefit from such an exchange. We're aware that, existing that there are existing avenues 
um, but these should be expanded and continued. Uh, you know, a, an ideal option would be to establish more formally institutionalized forum for dialogue for each LTS iteration. Um, the LTS should, the commission should also enforce compliance with its own rules. Four LTSs today are still unaccounted for, almost three years past the deadline, um, which has ostensibly created delays in uh, a commission review uh, of, the, of, the, of all of them. Um, and our assessment showed that for many documents fail or barely meet the mandatory content requirements. We are of course aware of the recent announcement to commit infringement proceedings. And this, this, is, this is an important step, good important first step, um, not least because it validates the arguments that national adv advocacy groups have been making for a long time. Finally, and certainly not least, there is need for an updated EU LTS. This would go a long way to creating an integrated EU vision for climate neutrality based on the national perspectives that exist. And if done right, uh, and done with, with the right participatory channels could re reiterate the importance of robust long-term planning in advance of the scheduled LTS updates in a couple of years time. So thank you, that's, that's all from my side. Um, and I look forward to, to the panel discussion.